What is up, Ten Gang? Welcome back to another video. Uh, as you can see in the background, I did recently graduate from UT Austin, and I'm still very much processing those emotions of no longer being two blocks away from my closest friends and having to leave this place I've called home for the last four years, barring COVID. Um, however, this video is about my medical school application timeline. At least for me, a lot of the stress and anxiety that this cycle of ap applying engendered stemmed from not knowing exactly when things were going to happen. And so by that, I mean, I, I didn't know exactly when to submit my primary application or start writing my secondary essays or expect interview invites to start rolling in. And so by sharing my timeline, I hope to mitigate and alleviate some of that uncertainty and thereby also assuage the uh, some of the stress and anxiety that naturally comes with applying to medical schools. Um, so with that being said, let's get right into my timeline. I'll pull up the timeline here just as a static image, but uh, the first thing I should note is that the MCAT and um, course requisites that are needed to apply to medical school, uh, I'm not going to address in this video. I've already made some videos about the MCAT and how to study for it, if you'd like to check them out. Um, and for some extra uh, context, I took my MCAT in January 2021. So it's within this timeline, I just didn't include it. Let's jump into the timeline itself. The first task being the personal statement. I started this stage as soon as I finished my MCAT on January 16th, 2021. And by started, I don't mean that I began writing my final draft on January 17th, but more so that I began ruminating about the experiences that have been most formative throughout my um, upbringing and college experience and that have most uh, strongly directed me toward a career in medicine. And I think this was a very reflective and valuable process for me because I reaffirmed um, myself that medicine is what I want to do. And I also um, gained a lot of appreciation for the art of writing because in this process, I also read a lot of people's memoirs, you know, outside of medicine, um, as well as some medical narratives. And every once in a while, I would come across a sentence or, um, or combination of sentences that was such beautifully written, uh, so beautifully written, like there, there was no better way to convey an idea than, than, than what was laid out on the page before me. Um, that, you know, it, it, so, so that those were very inspiring, um, um, kind of outside influences that, that kind of motivated me in this stage. So I'd recommend you, uh, keep reading and, um, kind of look for those sources of inspiration during this stage. Um, and I had a solid enough draft to continue developing in middle of March. And the way I knew it was solid enough was I asked my sister to read it and she was picking up what I was putting down. Uh, that's a pretty good test, in my opinion, to see if you're you're effectively conveying your ideas. And by the end of May, I had a piece that I was pretty proud of, and I think like pretty accurately and um, precisely conveys my intentions for going into medicine. Um, and you know, in in late May slash early June is when I encourage people to submit their applications. Uh, or submit their primary applications. And so um, the timeline of my personal statement kind of aligned uh, perfectly with that. So the next topic is recommendation letters. And in early February, I started reaching out to professors who I thought were most heavily invested in my future career. And I asked them if they'd write me a strong recommendation letter. And if so, if they'd be willing to meet with me over Zoom for 15 minutes. And in these meetings, I would share more about my intentions of going to medical school, as well as my specific interests within medicine being older adult advocacy and neurosurgery. And looking back, I'm very glad that I asked for these meetings because if you think about it, uh, asking someone to write you a rec letter is very similar to asking them to uh, join your cause or to join your team. And in, uh, in any other team, um, it's very important for people to be on the same page for everyone to know why you're why they're there and why they're pursuing the objectives that they are. And uh, in essence, by having these meetings with my professors, um, I was able to do that. Um, I was able to offer myself an opportunity to share information 
that in turn could help the letter of rec writers write more compelling and um, uh, just stronger letters that were more congruent with my overall application. And this task uh, ranges from February to May, just because I encourage um, sending out the requests in around February and then asking them to be sent in by the end of May. Next, we have work and activities, and this also spans February to May. However, all of this work here is on your own uh, in contrast to the recommendation letters. And a lot of, or most of this section is again, reflection and writing, but the, re the writing here is different from the personal statement writing in my opinion, because it's, it's more of a technical, dis technical description of your responsibilities and your takeaways and your contributions um, in each of the activities that you list. And um, I also finished this by May so that I could submit my primary application in that time. All right, in the next phase, we move past the primary AMCAS application and to the secondary application. So the idea is um, once AMCAS sends off your primary application to all the schools you've designated you'd like to apply to um, on, on your AMCAS portal, once your schools receive uh, the information they need about you, um, then they'll send you this secondary application for you to write more essays about, uh, typically they're more about like why you want to go to that school specifically, uh, what in medicine interests you, um, or sometimes they're very creative uh, essay prompts. And so it's, it's kind of like the supplementary application if you remember back, back, in, um, back when you were applying to colleges. And so this, this phase lasted for me from June to August. Um, and it was, it was also like a full-time writing job, just like the personal statement felt like, but it was, it was uh, novel in the sense that along with doing a lot of reflection and writing and re revision and editing, I did a lot of research on, um, I did a lot of like just looking up what dis distinguished each school uh, from others. And for example, I found that Columbia has a very strong like community advocacy component uh, to their curriculum. Um, they also have um, a neurosurgery rotation and in the second, you know, in the clerkship year, which I don't remember reading about uh, that being an opportunity at any other medical school. Um, and uh, Stanford, you know, they're very known for entrepreneurship and technology um, and like uh, Penn is very, uh, distinguished for interdisciplinary collaborations between like Wharton in the medical school, um, the design school in the medical school. So um, each school kind of has their personality and I was able to um, uh, become familiar a little bit with, with, with their personalities during this stage. Um, and yeah, so, so, you know, even though it's a very, um, it's a very demanding like uh, time. You know, you're writing, you're writing anywhere from two to eight essays for each, uh, for each school. And if you apply to 26 schools like I did, then you can do the math. It's a lot of essays. For this secondary stage, I should note that on Student Doctor Network, people often advertise a two week time frame from uh, when you receive the secondary application uh, from the, the the school and when you send it back. Uh, so when you send your completed essays back. And for me, this time frame wasn't super realistic. Um, I was in Jamaica at the time. I was working on a project uh, to develop hands-on science lessons with local primary teachers in the region. And um, so following the two-week time frame would have led to my essays being of like a quality I would not have been proud of. And so I opted for a four to six week time frame instead. I can't say that this didn't hurt me. Um, it might have, but I uh, reasoned that I'd rather take a longer time than um, to accelerate my writing and like risk, you know, sending something in that I just didn't resonate with. And so um, even the advice I'm giving you t you now and um, the advice you read on Student Doctor Network, like please take them with grains of salt and apply only what's relevant to your situation. Um, and if something goes counter uh, what you believe, then by all means, forego it. The last phase is interviews. And I had my first interview invite in July, 2021. And my last interview happened in February, 2022. 
And between these two dates, I did a lot of preparatory work, uh, prepping for the two main styles of interviews, behavioral and MMI. MMI stands for multiple mini interview. And um, in the MMIs, you're presented with ethical scenarios, ethical dilemmas, where you're asked to provide, where you're asked to describe your, uh, your like, your the actions that you would take in that scenario. And the idea is that this is a more objective way to evaluate applicants because for each scenario, a different interviewer is evaluating you. Um, and so to prepare for this, I did a lot of cases um, uh, with my friend Jay, who was also applying to medical school at the, in the same cycle as I was and is in the same business program as I am, um, or I guess I'm graduating now, so as I was. Um, and it, it really helped to go through these example cases and to give each other feedback on, okay, this is how you can be more logical or um, more like coherent with your answer, or this is how you can um, uh, like consider more, th more than one perspective and be more empathetic, be more, uh, be more considerate of all of the players involved in this scenario. So I think it was a very, um, it, it was a pretty fun process uh, just to like, you know, some of the scenarios are pretty ludicrous, uh, but but a lot of, like you realize that they're actually like really relevant uh, to medicine. Like for one, for one example uh, that we ran through, it regarded a Jehovah's Witness family, and the the there was a patient um, who's a little girl uh, who's like bleeding to death, and because in Jehovah Witness religion. Um, um, it's like uh, taboo or it's against the religion to receive blood transfusions. Uh, the mother is refusing uh, blood transfusions for her own daughter. And as a doctor, like, what do you do? So that's kind of one example of an ethical dilemma. And um, it's, it's uh, not only like, you know, interesting to um, entertain as like, as a dilemma as it is, but it's uh, quite fulfilling and like I think it's quite productive to practice answering these questions as future doctors um, Yeah, so the other style of interview that I mentioned behavioral um, This type of interview style is like more familiar to us um, and The way I prepared for this was just to draft answers to the most common behavioral questions such as tell me about a time you failed and how you overcame the failure um, Tell me about your like strengths, strengths and weaknesses. I also became like I also made sure I was very familiar and um, um, comfortable talking about all my experiences that I wrote about in my primary application because I knew that was for fair game uh, for their questions. And um, I tried to be I tried to like pre-script a lot of my um, a lot of my answers so I could be more eloquent or like be more clear with my descriptions of my activities. Um, but ultimately, like when the interviews came around, uh, that's like the foundational layer that you have. You know, if you're comfortable talking about all the things on your application, like you're prepared. But on top of that, in the interview, you have to be 100% present so that you can, you know, try to like connect with the interviewer, have her, have like a productive, um, like meaningful conversation with them. All right, so here I'm showing you school by school what my timeline looked like in terms of when I received the secondary, uh, when I submitted each secondary, if I got an interview at all, uh, if so, when I got it, um, and when when it was scheduled to be, as well as when I heard back from each school. Um, and you can see if I, you know, for example, if I didn't get an interview invite, um, which was the case at UT McGovern, then I just left the interview date and decision blank because, um, well, yeah, I was I was essentially rejected before the interview, um, and for Dell Medical School, they didn't have a secondary, um, or they didn't have a written secondary that I that I needed to do, so it's not on this list. So this chart kind of puts more clearly what I was talking about uh, regarding the secondary timeline. So if you look at the gap between when I received and submitted my secondaries, most of them are greater than two weeks. Um, if you then look at my interview invites and interview dates, mo more of them are later in the cycle than early. 
And uh, so take from that what you will. Again, because this is such a black box process, you can't really generalize and uh, um, uh, expect that if you submit your secondary by this date, you should hear an interview invite from this date, uh, like by this date. So yeah, none of those rules can firmly apply in my opinion, but nonetheless, I saw one of these charts um, on Prerac Juzdani's channel, uh, like when I was in the cycle and it kind of helped um, provide some reference for myself. So I hope that this chart provides a similar uh, utility. Um, and again, don't read into it too much. So that brings us to the end of this video. Um, going through all of those steps, again, reminded me of how grueling and taxing of a process this really is. And um, I think the fact that my, my voice is straining, kind of hurting because of the sheer number of takes I've had to do uh, because I've left out like an important detail. I think that itself is quite emblematic of how arduous and detailed and involved this application is. So if you're going through this process right now, I want to say I'm there with you. And also you have a lot to be proud about. Um, you, you've taken hard classes to get this to this point. You've taken what's arguably the beast of all tests, the MCAT, and perhaps most of all, you're considering a field, a demanding field that's dedicated to the welfare and well-being of, of other people, which I think is admirable in itself. Um, and if at any point in this process you're feeling overwhelmed, know that that's normal. And also remind yourself of your reasons. And ideally, or hopefully, no one's forcing you down this route uh, so that you can really appreciate that what you glean from this process how you go about this process is completely up to you. And for me, what I wanted to glean was reflection. I wanted to reaffirm myself that medicine was for me. I wanted to ask myself what type of contributions, what type of person um, do I want to become? What kind of doctor do I want to become in my future career? And I think by doing that, I was able to regain some agency in what otherwise is solely an arduous and, um, and, and just like very difficult journey. Um, so I, I encourage you to, again, just be recognize that you should be proud of yourself, but also take this process as an opportunity to reflect, um, on, on what, what kind of contributions you want to make to medicine. So with all, all that being said, um, thanks for watching this video and if you have any video requests, leave them in the comments below. Um, and I appreciate your continuous support. Um, subscribe to the Tang Gang if you have not already. And I will see you all in the next video. Peace out.